Let the love I share speak for me. Let the love I share speak for me. When I'm lying in my grave and there's nothing more to say, let the love I share speak for me. Let the songs I sing speak for me. Let the songs I sing speak for me. When I'm lying in my grave and there's nothing more to say, let the songs I sing speak for me. We have a special moment uh, to honor of transition right now for two of our youth that have grown up in this church as we recognize and celebrate the high school graduation of Amelia Singer and Braden Kilroy. You have crossed a threshold as you walked across that stage to receive your high school diploma. And as you now get ready to move from high school to college, you are now beginning the journey of young adulthood. So Amelia and Brayden, please join us up here for a moment. So during your time here, at UUCGL, you have grown up, you have practiced discerning and identifying the values that you hold as sacred and learn to act based on these values. We, your faith community, trust you and bless you as you travel forward in life from this safe harbor into the great vast ocean of the unknown. But know that this community is always here for you, a safe harbor to which you can return whenever you need to, and we hope that you will. Amelia and Braden, we are very proud of you, and we're pleased to prevent you, uh, to present you, excuse me, <laughs> prevent you from, uh, with our heartfelt congratulations and these gifts. It's a small token of our affection and care for you and goes with our blessings. We send you forth knowing that you will bring the heart of Unitarian Universalism with you. May love carry you forward and may you carry love forward. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Blessings, honey. Just giving you a little hand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Blessings. Blessings, honey. Here they are. It is time to recognize our faith development teachers and program leaders. Uh, we'd like to invite up all those who were able to make it here today. And this is, this is a really big group. And so I'm going to name all of you who have taught and led programming this year. And this is going to be alphabetical by last name. Uh, and uh, I'll name people whether you're here in person or here uh, just with us in spirit. And please come up when I call your name and, uh, and stand up here. Lissa Anderson, Nikki Buscemi, Jack Butterworth, Julian Collins, Martha Curry, Suzanne Chapman, Eileen Cummings, Amanda Mack, Bonnie Fishman, Ron Fishman, Suzanne Forgioni, Mary Gatlin, Rebecca Green, Ruth Griffin, Anne Marie Haxtian. Mary Ann Hayes, 
Doreen Hodgkin, Susan Kelly, Mary Keen Galtieri, Peter Keen Galtieri, Gloria Kozlowski, Regina Mellis, Ruby Michaud, Carla Moniz, Michael Paquette, Anne Principe, Elizabeth Smith, and Megan White. We don't have enough room for everybody. <laughs> I know it can be uncomfortable to stand here for a moment. I'm just going to name with broad strokes the ministry and teaching uh, uh, and leading of our faith development programming this year. It's been an incredible year of programming, and so we'd like to take a moment on this. You all have offered Sunday morning faith development programming throughout the year, teaching our fundamental values and principles in interactive and fun ways, including the many special celebrations and holidays we have all enjoyed. You've offered an ongoing high school youth group with service and learning and bonding opportunities that has included welcoming the Salem youth to join us. You've offered Our Whole Lives, a truly life-saving and life-affirming curriculum around sexuality and identity, LGBTQ+, and reproductive rights, bullying and bystander prevention training to 5th and 6th grade, 7th and 8th grade, parents and adults, to participants of our church in the larger community and our other churches regionally as well. You've offered the programming of fellowship and community building to so many of us at our Ferry Beach Retreat, our Thursday night cooking group, our Sunday evening potlucks, and our summer beach potlucks. You've offered major educational events and programs in service of the people and the environment in the North Shore with our partners such as My Brother's Table, St. Stephen's, Kids in Community, in support of the guests of the Lynn Shelter Association at North Shore Pride and in support of our beaches. You've offered consistent and ongoing faith development for adults in our church and beyond through programs such as the Mindfulness-Based Meditation Practice Group, our Wisdom Circle, our Dialogue Group, our Saturday Craft Group, and also one-time events such as the theater games this summer. This is truly what a vibrant and engaged congregation looks like, where the congregation has ownership of the faith development we provide for each other and for the larger community and that ownership extends beyond our faith development programming to so many of you who've helped out in other ways. You have all committed to living out the ministry of this church together, some of you leading multiple days a week, yep. weekly or monthly programs, for you and for everyone that has volunteered this year in assisting with teaching and program leadership. Let's have a round of applause. Yeah. May you continue to bless in these ways.
I remember mine. His name was George Papa George. <laughs> he was such a nice man. Now, at the time, I thought he was an, an, you know, an old man, and I'm sure he was younger than I am now. That's okay. <laughs> but here's what I remember most about Mr. Papa George. He falsely accused me of being flagr flagrantly disrespectful when I was not at all trying to be. I was, in fact, trying to stay awake in his class. Mr. Papa George was trying to teach us how to diagram sentences, you see, which none of us seem to be getting. Do you remember diagramming sentences? How many of you learned to do that? So yeah, I mean, teaching grammar in this way ha has really gone out of fashion, and it was already going out of fashion back then. So I'm not even sure why the school was attempting to teach language skills this way. The whole class was silent and stymied. I think a few kids were getting it, but I was just trying to keep my eyes open. Absolutely no intention of being funny or rude, I let out a fairly quiet yawn, and I'm pretty sure, because this is how my parents raised me, put your hand over your mouth, I let out a little yawn, but at the end, I, I concluded with one of the descending scales of <laughs> Unfortunately, Mr. Papa George happened to whip his head around right at that moment, and he caught sight of me just as my face was particularly contorted. And he thought that I was putting on a show, and he lost it. This mild-mannered man shouted at me, berating me for my insolence. And I sat there wide-eyed with shock under this verbal pummeling. I was an A student. I was a good kid. I was a model citizen of West Elementary School. I didn't get in trouble. And when Mr. Papa George yelled something about me letting out a big ho-hum yum, which I still don't know what that means. Is that an actual expression, letting out a ho-hum yum, to describe a yawn? I don't know. The rest of the class broke out into laughter, which of course did not help matters much. We recognized that Mr. Papa George was just a little unhinged in that moment. It was on the edge of scary. And I remember through the rest of the day, I felt quite shocked and I wasn't sure what to do. I just, I, I didn't want him to look at me. I didn't know, should I apologize? Or if I should, um, what, how do, what do I apologize for? Um, am I going to set him off again? Maybe Mr. Papa George even apologized to us. I don't remember. He may have. Again, as I said, he was a very kind man. What I really took away from that moment was something that Mr. Papa George taught me that was probably more valuable than any actual academic lesson he had ever given us, which was that teachers have a hard job. It had never really dawned on me before. For a while, I genuinely worried that I had driven my nice teacher to a nervous breakdown. <laughs> he opened my eyes. I never again after that day didn't pay attention to my teachers as people. And if any of you have been classroom teachers, have you ever run into your kids like at the gas station or something and they're like, oh my gosh, it's Miss Weinstein. I used to be a classroom teacher before I went into ministry. Oh, it's Miss Weinstein. Because, right, our teachers basically slept on cots in the school. And at the end of the day, they just went into their cots and got rolled up into the wall for all we knew. As the 19th century father of American Unitarianism, William Ellery Channing once said, to a graduating class of seminarians, may your life preach more loudly than your lips. It does, our lives do. And the pressure is constant. The responsibility doesn't end. And it isn't just for those who teach in the classroom. We are always teaching. 
What are we teaching with our lives? Children are watching. Colleagues are watching. Spouses are watching and absorbing. And we, them, and neighbors are watching. People in line with us at the airport waiting to board the flight are watching. And everyone has a camera on them these days. So if someone does teach by negative example, well, that tends to get shared with millions of people immediately via the uh, wonders of social media. Families on the blanket a few feet away from ours on the beach are watching and learning what we are teaching through our actions, our tone of voice, our presence. We are social creatures. We are also primates. And we figure out how to be humans from being together. I think it's quite naive and a missed opportunity when we dismiss this kind of activity of social learning by saying, oh, live and let live, or mind your own business. If you notice, life gives us many opportunities to stand at the crossroads of mind my own business, and maybe I can be a teacher of a better way of living in this moment. And that's a really, really tender crossroads to stand at, and we do stand there frequently. Here's an example of what I mean. It was a very, very hot summer in 1998. I was living in Pennsylvania outside of Philly. I was the assistant minister at the Mainline Unitarian Church in Devon, Pennsylvania. We were in the midst of a heat wave. Several consecutive days over 100 degrees and muggy. I was in the building, in the church building, in the evening alone, and I heard a commotion at our front door. Now, this church, very similar to this one, was located in a residential, very heavily wooded area. It was actually a converted mansion. So I heard this um, commotion at the front door. We didn't get a lot of drop-ins, so I went to see maybe somebody needs to get let in, but I, there was a lot of noise going on, and as I opened the door, I heard sobbing, and I saw a young mother with two little boys, one of whom was howling and in tears, and here's what he was saying, I don't want to go to the jail, mommy! Don't make me go to the jail! And I stood there really awkwardly. I said something like, can I help you? The mother, clearly exhausted, said to me, sotto voce, I know it's terrible, because I know this is a church and you're probably wonderful people and I feel really bad, but sometimes I tell my boys that this is a jail and they're gonna, I'm gonna take them here and leave them if they're bad. Okay, so there I was at that crossroads. Mind your own business, or maybe a teachable moment. You know, like, this is parenting. I can't interfere with this, or can I? Or should I? Do I have something to offer? You very often do. You very well might, especially when children or other vulnerable beings are involved, you might just have something important to teach. Just meddling isn't gonna go very well, unwelcome. We know, you know, what we call those people, we call them a Karen nowadays. If you haven't heard that expression, a Karen has come to mean a meddling busybody, usually with racist overtones, who is policing and gatekeeping with a sense of entitlement. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about interfering with people and bothering them and uh, trying to get them in trouble. I'm talking about those moments when we feel called to engage from a place of sympathy and solidarity, from recognizing we all need help from time to time. This is why we are constantly in training 
in the church, which I like to call an academy for the spirit, this community of moral engagement. Because if we are not constantly reflecting on our values and engaging in spiritual practices like consideration, mindfulness, prayer, um, encountering our own uh, failings and weaknesses, a service where we brush up against a lot of different kinds of people and learn more that way. Other spiritual practices could be compassionate confrontation with mistakes or failures. All of those practices um, help us to be ready to meet those crossroad moments when what we have to teach and give may be a life-saving alternative to what is currently being offered in that moment. This is not to say that any one of us is perpetually virtuous or wiser than anyone else out there. It's to say that through the practice of religious life, we may often be clearer and more prepared to engage, to step in, to show up a little bit more prepared than someone else, or we might be better prepared to join others who are similarly committed to teaching peace. Um, de-escalation, depolarization, inclusion, and kindness. In that moment outside the church, because I bet you're wondering what happened, right? <laughs> What'd she do? I was like, my first instinct was like, give me those kids. Let's get away from mommy. You know, this isn't a jail, right? That was my first instinct, but I knew, oh, I can't do that. That's wrong. But this little boy's being hurt. Now, I want to tell you, talk about child resilience, his little brother. So these kids were like seven and four, maybe, or seven and three years old. The little one was going like this. Yay, I want to go to the jail. I can't, I, I want to go to the jail. So I was like, kid, I don't know what's going on with you, but right on. So I didn't want to rebut the mother, but I could show up for her. And so I said, I immediately flipped from the harmed child to mom's not doing okay. Mama's not doing okay here. And I said, hey, mom, tough day, huh? And she started bawling. And somebody just said, right, yeah. And she, she started bawling and she goes, it's been so hot. I don't know, did she have an air-conditioned home? You know, who was helping her? I have no idea, maybe no one. So then I had two sobbing children and one excited little guy to invite into the church, into the air conditioning, to just sit with them for a while to cool off, on several levels, to cool off, just to keep her company for a while. We take our turns. Sometimes it's me whose emotional car drives off the road, and who needs the calmer, more grounded person to show up for me? Sometimes it's you. But you know who it almost never is that shows up for us? A celebrity, an author, or a guru that you might know from the literary or the spiritual rock star leadership world of TED Talks and YouTube. I appreciate those people. I appreciate their writings. I watch their lectures and their presentations. Um, but when it comes to the life lessons that I will remember that change and transform and save me, that happens through times that God puts someone in my path face to face in real life. I do believe, but not at all incidentally, that God puts us in each other's paths that there is a mostly unconscious soul desire that draws us together and that prompts us to risk our comforts and certainties of the ego for something more authentic, deeper, and more life-saving. The men and women who teach, so many of them, I mean, did you see that crowd? Did not offer to do so here because they believe themselves to be paragons of spiritual maturity at all times. That's not what they offered when they agreed to get trained as an owl instructor 
or to teach Tai Chi or to lead a poetry workshop. What they offered was themselves, their willingness to stand in that position of teaching, to offer their lives, their beliefs that engaging in learning with the community is meaningful and helpful to everyone, including them to stir up that excitement that William Ellery Channing talked about. And this is the essence of being a local community influencer. It's not to gain more followers like the social media influencers that we, most of us know and some are quite in thrall of. It's not to gain more lucrative sponsorship deals with corporations to sneak ad content into one's talks or TikToks or to promote one's next lecture series or bestseller. We who teach on the local face-to-face -face community in real life level are also always those who learn and vice versa. Thank you to the teachers, to the ones who prepare the lessons, who hold the participants in their hearts and think about them between classes, because I know you do, who consider the content and fine tune it every time, because I know you do. Bless also the ones who show up to learn, to consider together, to prepare intentionally to stand with wisdom at those crossroad moments in life, to become excited at every age of ga um, by gaining a new insight, who are thrilled when they have another veil lifted, and who love to share the deep fellowship of gaining understanding together in community. This is an academy for the spirit. To teach is powerful, and to learn is just as powerful. This is the influence I pray that we will all bring into our encounters with that world outside these doors. To seek knowledge in freedom, as we say in our unison affirmation, to seek knowledge in freedom as a way of serving human need. What a sacred calling. Let us embrace it with enthusiasm and reverence. So mote it be. I wonder how those little boys are doing today. <laughs>